the title of my talk, uh, as I said, Shades of Grey, and it has nothing to do with that book, uh, Vicarious Experience and the Power of Things in American Civil War Reenactment. So, uh, among the uh, historical reenactors that I uh, found myself among in 2010, um, experience was indeed a key concept. So my paper deals with the relentless quest among reenactors for the ultimate vicarious experience, that is, the coming as close as possible to what it must have been like for real flesh and blood Civil War soldiers, uh, and with the ways in which this striving is connected to and dependent upon, dependent upon material objects and ensembles of objects or things. So my presentation is based on ethnographic fieldwork in and around uh, the iconic field of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania in 2010, where I stayed for five months, uh, and a short follow-up visit last year for the 150th anniversary of the battle. And I also draw a little bit on my parallel studies of Danish living history uh, uh, enthusiasts. So I want to explore reenactors' social and material aspirations as what historiographer Eva Domanska has called a material hermeneutics. I want to discuss this uh, privileging of experience in a particular embodied and materialized version, and I'll do so by contrasting it with another modality of accessing the past, uh, which I uh, let, uh, which is represented or epitomized here by the U.S. National Park Service and its so-called rehabilitation program of the Gettysburg battlefield, which is a different approach that aims for historical understanding attained via a visual cleansing of the landscape. Then towards the last bit of my paper, I will begin to discuss the complex political and ethical aspects inherent in the restating of specific historical perspectives and narratives, and the claims to authenticity and authority that is inherent in them. So the power of things, if you will, is also a power connected to the material manifestation of certain and selected aspects of the past proposed as true and reenactment is often utilized in the service of politically orthodox and sometimes exclusivist historical positions or claims. Uh, and I will grant that this is so, but I will also argue in my paper, perhaps uh, naively or optimistically, that such a stance is not uh, a necessary inherent quality in reenactment, which can, I believe, in fact, become a vehicle of critical historical thinking. Um, what emerges then in my talk is a cautious call for a reflexive and explorative engagement with reenactment and related performative practices that acknowledges their considerable power uh, but at the same time insists on the possibilities of alternative perspectives and pasts. So this is my uh, field, if you will. This is actually the, the Confederate company that I was enrolled in in 2010. I'm not in the picture, but uh, these are the guys that... Um, I became um, I hooked up with, I guess. Um, so, this is as real as it gets, I was ensured by Sven, who is a member of a Danish group of history buffs reenacting historical battles from the 19th century. Dressed in home sewn uniforms and armed with historical weapons, he and his friends travel historical festivals, commemoration ceremonies, and open air museums staging spectacular and well-attended mock battles and historical episodes. At such events, Sven explained to me, the audience can almost touch a living soldier from 1864, see his uniform, see his hat, his knapsack, see his gun and how to load it. He argued to me that to the average visitor, this is different from a dry little, this is different from a dry little book from some history teacher in 1947 who told him something he has forgotten all about. Unquote Sven. Such comments correspond to Richard Handler and William Saxton's finding that although they are almost, by definition, keenly committed to history, quote, living histor historians explicitly devalue written history, history as it is found in books, unquote. Now, this is something I have found to be generally true in my own studies, although my informants relationship to written history was not as purely negative as Handler and Sexton suggest. Indeed, many of them consumed vast amounts of historical literature. 
However, and importantly, I think, when it comes to the communication aspect of the historical insights, so the dimension of teaching directed at an audience or instruction, if you will, the living or experiential approach is generally assumed to be superior. Part of their ambition, then, is, to, is communicating or teaching history as true or real as it gets to others. It is also, however, and to many reenactors more than anything, I would say, about sensing an authentic past themselves, and by doing so, obtaining a sense of a real self. So to quote uh, Handler and Sexton again, um, an authentic experience to be achieved in the practice of living history is one in which individuals, individuals feel themselves to be in touch both with the real world and with their real selves, unquote. The disregard for mere bookish knowledge was key to Jonathan, another reenactor, one of the leaders of the American Civil War reenactment company that I joined in 2010. He told me that I got into it because I wanted what the books couldn't give me. Again, we see the explicit opposition set up between reenactment and book-based learning. And he elaborated, and sorry for the long quote here. I started studying the American Civil War when I was in middle school, and I just automatically got hooked and read everything I could get my hands on. So this is from an interview. Ken Burns came out with his Civil War documentary at the same time I was getting into it, and as I'm reading it and seeing it, I'm always wondering, what was it like? What was it like, you know, walking a mile in somebody's shoes? And when I found out they did reenactment, I was like, I've got to try that, I've got to do that. Then I found the first local reenactment unit in my area, and I joined them, and it was really amazing to really walk a mile in their shoes and to get that experience. Jonathan's perceived clash between bookish knowledge and lived experience is typical of my reenactor informants, both Danish and American. Although someone like Jonathan possessed a vast and quite detailed knowledge of the Civil War, obtained from an almost obsessive devouring of Civil War literature, battle descriptions, and drill manuals, such theoretical knowledge is understood to be inadequate for capturing a real sense of what it was like, of obtaining, we may say, a vicarious experience. Now, why describe it as vicarious? One ambition of my presentation today is to explore what might be gained by looking at reenactment through this term. And since I like playing with words, I have found a dictionary definition, according to which we find uh, four related but distinct meanings of the word vicarious. So the first one, and maybe the most, most important one, felt or undergone as if one were taking part in the experience of feelings of another, read about mountain climbing and experienced vicarious thrills. Um, and the other ones, uh, I would suggest, could also be utilized. So clearly the first of these, the quest for the experience or feelings of another, lies at the core of both Sven's and Jonathan's comments I quoted. I want to go on to suggest, however, that some of these other meanings, especially perhaps the third one, focusing on uh, substitution or delegation, so 3A, acting or serving in place of someone or something else, substituted or be committed or entrusted to another as powers of authority, delegated, um, may actually serve a helpful analytical purpose in teasing out some of the key qualities associated with reenactment, but also perhaps opening up a more critical discussion. These critical questions to, that I will pursue towards the end of my talk uh, regard the politics and the power of historical reenactment, and could, uh, for now, maybe be phrased like this, substituted for what, or delegated by whom. So, I want to, uh, before I get to that uh, discussion, I want to get back to the uh, hat, the knapsack, and the gun that Sven described, and also to the shoes that Jonathan found so amazing. Back to the materials, the things of reenactment. For I think it's true to say that while a number of important studies, at least in the English literature, have examined historical reenactment and living history interpretation, relatively little attention has until now been paid to the material dimension, so central, I would say, in these contexts, and to the role that objects and tangibles play in shaping a desire for something going beyond conventional, conventional representation. So to American reenactors, the pursuit of the ultimate 
Civil War experience includes an unending fascination with materials and material qualities, especially with those that come together in what is called your personal kit, that is uniforms, clothing, weapons, equipment, and so on. So coming across as authentic, and I will not go into large discussions about authenticity, but we could do that in discussion if we want, but coming across as authentic depends to a large degree on the quality of your and your company comrades' kit, kits, which constitute the material basis of your so-called impression. Now, many of you who know about living history probably know all of this, but um, your so-called impression, which is a complex cover term that is used to denote both the particular part a given group is expected to fulfill in a specific reenactment. So you could say, uh, in this battle, our impression will be the 15th Alabama, something like that. But it also uh, 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 refers to the degree to which one's portrayal is credible or accurate. So you could say, he, he did a fantastic impression, or he had a fantastic impression. So impression in this understanding concerns a great deal of expression, you could say. And it also comprises and binds together a number of less outright material factors, such as stature and pose, facial work, uh, and skill. So, in turn, the quality of your personal impression relies heavily on your company and its collective orchestrations. A convincing impression thus distinguishes the serious reenactor called on the US scene um, campaigners, progressives, or hardcores, uh, from the so-called mainstreamer or the weekend warrior or the FAB, which is a term many of you probably know. Um, strange term for amateur reenactors, unserious people. And while it is not in itself sufficient, a quality kit is a prerequisite for a quality impression. So, even though we may, uh, to come back to Handler and Sexton's important article from 1988, speak of living history as a subculture seeking what they term Handel and Saxton, quote, an authenticity of experience, which is comprised of largely intangible sensations, atmosphere, and emotions, I would argue that such qualities cannot be separated from a number of tangible objects uh, and their powers. Indeed, I would say they, they revolve around them. So the material dimension is crucial. The stuff, if you will, uh, is crucial in facilitating the experience experiential authenticities that they, that they talk about. A great deal of concrete labor, assembly work, or what I have referred to as patchwork in a, in a recent article, or an article that's actually coming out uh, now, um, is invested in producing, maintaining, and improving your kit. This patchwork involves processes of selection and priority juggling, and also very often actual sewing work or repair and maintenance duties. So, to come back to Jonathan, already quoted, he described his movement within the reenactment hobby from this so-called mainstreaming approach towards a more serious campaigning one as follows. So he said, when I first started, it was more of a mainstream unit. We didn't carry everything on our backs. Our uniforms were all machine sewn and synthetically dyed and we, they never fell apart and we never lost a button and we slept in tents on cots with coolers. But, you know, for the past seven, eight years, maybe even longer, I've been doing the campaign side of reenacting, where, you know, our uniforms are mostly hand-stitched, they do fall apart, and you have to stitch them up, and you do lose buttons, um, and you carry everything on your back. So, patchworking, in, in, in my uh, uh, designation of this term, summarizes these processes of stitching together, combining bits and pieces, um, on the tactile level of the object, but also I would suggest in combination with what you could say was bits and pieces of accumulated and shared knowledge. And I would also suggest that this ceaseless sense of maintenance extends well beyond the concrete working of actual materials to a more general or maybe even abstract level. So infusing a sense of agency, of working on history, if you will, as such, uh, and providing participants with powerful experiences of uh, having a go or having a say in the construction of history itself. This fascination with history experienced as what we may call unfinished business thus constitutes a powerful driver in reenactment. And this is not just me, I mean, that's several of the um, 
anglophone studies that suggested this uh, sort of unfinishedness as a key, key attraction for reenactors. So onto what I uh, talked about as uh, material hermeneutics. My approach to analyzing uh, the role of objects and materials in reenactment is inspired by uh, actor network theory uh, of Bruno Latour and others, as well as another academic approaches that theorize the intimate relationships between people and things and the ways in which concrete human material constellations empower and engender particular acts and activities. It's also close to what a historian and historiographer Eva Domanska has called a material hermeneutics, a term she adopts from a philosopher of science, Don Ide, or Ide, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Anyway, the basic point, as summed up by Domanska, is that instruments co-constitute the reality studied by scholars, and she is summing up Don Ide's argument here. Their role is not simply instrumental, but hermeneutic. They shape the ways that people gain access to reality. In such, a rea in such an approach, we witness an expansion of hermeneutics from texts to materiality. Human interpretations of reality are not to be understood in terms of textual and linguistic structures only, but also as mediated by artifacts. In the same vein as Latour, who claims that the social sciences have too exclusively fo focused on humans and forgotten about non-humans, hermeneutics has only been using half its capacity, occupying itself only with texts and neglecting things. Unquote. Now, there are several other related schools of theory that could be sort of summoned and aligned with this, including the so-called non-representational theory uh, from geography, from people like Nigel Thrift. But I have picked uh, Domanska here since she works specifically on understanding the role and consequence of this new materialism or material turn for understanding people's relations to the past, configuring her analysis around what she terms presence and also related to, we heard earlier about uh, Gumbrecht's um, presence uh, work um, rather than representation. So things don't just signify, they actually act in such a perspective. Domanski draws on, also on Latour's ideas of, of a res publica, an object-oriented democracy focusing on, quote from Domanska, things that create a public sphere around them, unquote. And this is something she takes from Latour and Weibel's study. And also on, quote again, how publics gather around things, unquote. So, to my reenactors, things are precisely crucial and not merely as symbols, illustrations or representations of something else of the civil war, for instance. Even though they are, of course, also that. But they are also tools and in themselves, I would say, to quote Domanska again, relate and influence the production of knowledge, unquote. So the things of reenactment, even, the most, even if most of them are reproductions, really matter, I would say. And what I'm trying to get across is the way in which this mattering is precisely not merely a question of representation, or symbolism, or what Bourdieu has called uh, capital. So, hence, the material elements of a given reenactor's kit are indeed obvious signs of distinction and status, but they are much more than that. They are more, re more than representational, to use a term coined by geographer Haydn Lorimer. They have effect consequence, agency. And uh, to give an example of how such an extra symbolic more, if you will, unfolds in actual reenactment practice, we may turn again to the concept of impression. Impression, as I said, has more to it than outward appearance. If you cannot, as it were, embody your material kit with a matching persona or a parallel kit of knowledge, skills, devotion, your impression suffers. So Rob, who was the first sergeant of my company, exemplified this to me when we were talking about another group of self-proclaimed self campaigners, that is, uh, serious reenactors, a group calling themselves the Liberty Rifles. On the one hand, Rob admired these guys' top-notch gear and their picture-perfect appearances which had earned them several cover shoots on prestigious reenactment journals. However, Rob said, the LR's nice looks were not always backed up by discipline, by knowledge, and by stamina. 
Indeed, he jokingly referred to them as the leave early rifles, indicating that they would often be the first to pack up and leave an event when the going got tough, wet or cold. And Jeff, who was, uh, oh, I have a Yankee impression here. If you Jeff, who was another leading member of my group, brought up the same problem when we were discussing the role of objects. So he said, the stuff is important. But then he went on to point out the difference between what he called hardcore and hard cool. And he said, I mean, are you authentic because it's cool to be authentic? Or are you authentic because it's the right thing to do? You know, I mean, some of these guys with the cool jackets going, oh yeah, I got this really cool jacket from Chris Daly. It's almost like a fashion statement. Look at the stitches. Mine's a Jody Nolan. So these are uh, names of some of the most widely respected manufacturers of quality reenactment gear. And some group, groups, Jeff told me, had really cool kits. But then when it comes to actually do the work, do the job, they can't do it because they were boozing it up the night before. <laughs> so there's a whole drinking culture connected to some of the reenactment events out on the parking lots at night. I won't go into that now. But uh, it's fun as well. Um, clearly then, having the right stuff is not enough. There's something beyond, something more that, than surface representation. We may call it a thirst for experience, even vicarious experience, as long as we acknowledge that this is very much an ideal striven for, rather than something believed among the reenactors to be actually attained, or even attainable. So the spectacles staged were thus not understood to be one-on-one, -on -one, one to one reflections of the past, but invariably incomplete in comparison to the historical notes of reference to which they pointed. Mark, who was a young and energetic reenactor of my company, was very, very clear on this sense of lack on attainability and of how his own experience, for instance, of the Battle of Gettysburg, was so much thinner than the real deal of the 1860s. He told me that um, to him, Reenactment was about respecting men far better than me. Um, when I asked him why he had chosen to side with the Confederacy, he elaborated. The South was agrarian, he said. It's almost, it was almost chivalric, almost a very knightly society. And I can respect that cavalier attitude, and I emulate it in my daily life. And in the North, of course, was industry, merchants and bankers. And I see it as being a conflict between the farmer and the banker, literally. And well, the rest of history was written by the fact that the bankers and the merchants won. And I asked him, and, and you would side with the farmers? Every time, he said. Anybody that wants to preserve the countryside as a pristine area, I mean, it's beautiful. Trees and creeks, stones, those are beautiful. I think cities are ugly and stinky and just not pleasant places to be. So reenactment is also, as captured in quotes like these, full of absence and of nostalgic yearnings for a past that might never actually have been, but that might also, perhaps, according to people like Mark, should have been. So like the rest of my company, or most of the people in my company, Mark possessed a politically strongly conservative outlook, <coughs> believing in manly and martial ideals of self-sufficiency, courage, duty, and sacrifice for the common good, the common American good, you could say, all, to quote him, something that has been in a steady decline in this country, unquote. As such, a good deal of criticism of, of contemporary US culture, politics, urban development, crime rates, divorce, the school system, was built into the general outlook of the reenactment community. And not just the Confederates, I would say, but we could discuss that after. Often my informants would blame what they saw as a shady urban and politically liberal elite residing in Washington, D.C. and thereabouts, who, according to them, had no ideas about the lives and concerns of the common folk. And also, if we should stay focused on things, I would argue that my, my reenactors envisioned these uh, Washington, D.C. powers as a leaning urban elite preoccupied with words, rhetoric, endless talking, rather than honest things, crafting, action. So on, things. Uh, I'll get back to the question of the politics of reenactment in a short while, but first, as I said, I'll take a brief detour 
via a different mode of, mode of making sense of the Civil War past, which revolves about the notion of battlefield rehabilitation. So, if, I've argu if as I have argued, that the reenacted American Civil War is attractive, partly because of its feel of unfinishedness, it also serves at the same time as an implicit, but precisely enacted, critique of more conventional approaches to learning about and exhibiting history and heritage. We've seen already how the stereotype of the book is generally deemed insufficient as a source of real knowledge. Much the same could be said about Reenactor's relationship with the museum, so the museum as an archetype. Even if, if, if the museum is, in a sense, all about things. So why don't they like the museum in general? This, I, I would suggest, is because the museum is seen by Reenactor's as a paragon of representation, of rationality, of the non-experiential. In sharp contrast to the material culture that is usually exhibited behind glass in museums, the materiality celebrated in reenactment is precisely an experienced materiality, a preoccupation with things connected to touch and sensory immersion, not to vision, distance, and separation between viewer and viewed. So the stereotype of the museum glass cabinet, uh, the ropes, the, the, the uh, museum attendees, upholding distance. So we may say that if reenactment offers participation, agency, unfinishedness, improvisation and so on, on the other hand the museum, at least when viewed from the campfire of my reenactor informants, signals finished, untouchable, distanced and glass cased truths. I will not here uh, delve deeper into this uh, museum versus reenactment contrast. Instead, I'll introduce a few snippets of material from my larger Gettysburg study to outline uh, another mode of conceptualizing the battle and the Civil War past. One, I would argue, that is indeed closely connected to this museum modality or the scientific uh, mission of the museum, if you will. Revolving around the notion of a rehabilitation of the Gettysburg battlefield and uh, with the US uh, National Park Service, NPS, at its stern. Uh, so na the National Park Service is the federal ag agency that manages um, the, the 4,000 acre Gettysburg National Military Park and other national parks in the US. Uh, and I should say that while it's clearly different from the reenactor's immersive take on the past, the NPS perspective cannot be said to be anti-experiential. Surely the Park Service is all for providing visitors with the best possible Gettysburg experience. But I think it presents us with a different set of ideas about what experience is or can be and how it relates to perception, self, and perhaps also to uh, ideas of expertise or, or authority. So just to, to make clear, I'm not trying to define what is a true or real Gettysburg experience, but I'm aiming to reflect upon and analyze how others have conceptualized experience and the experiential in different ways. So, in the late 1990s, uh, the NPS began to draft and implement a series of policies that aimed for a purer image of the battlefield, and it has a longer history going back uh, into the 70s, uh, traced by uh, Jim Weeks in a brilliant book from 2003. But uh, this new course can be seen as a reaction against the rather unplanned and carnivalesque mushrooming of new structures, forms, and quite kitschy touristy genres dedicated to the memory of the Gettysburg battle that had been dominating until then and almost swamping the Gettysburg landscape with quite uh, interesting uh, facilities and uh, touristy trains and towers and everything. So the aim of this long-term and still ongoing federal rehabilitation policy is what is officially termed, as I said, a rehabilitation of the battlefield, a transformation of the current state of affairs, aspiring to bring the field as much in line with its 1863 appearance as possible. So battlefield rehabilitation, uh, NPS proposes, uh, is allowing visitors to have a more accurate understanding of obstacles faced by those in the field, as well as the command decision made by both armies. 
Over time, the project will offer new opportunities for visitors to see the battlefield through the soldiers' eyes. Now, the very term rehabilitation, we could say, which is, of course, imported from the realm of medical care, comes with its own set of connotations. One is to install a normative temporal scale with a clear reference point in time, July 1863, at which the patient, if you will, or in this case, the Gettysburg landscape, was assumingly fresh and unpolluted. The intermediate period in such a discourse is then invariably associated with illness, suffering, and encroaching degeneration, and with an obscuring of the original, desired state of affairs. Thus, the NPS in this rhetoric of historic rehabilitation takes on the role not only of protectors and preservationists, but also of interventionists, good-intentioned interventionists, insistent on cleansing the terrain of impurity in the name of scientific enlightenment, and of not merely halting, but actually reversing the degeneration. So the rehabilitation principles have been effectuated by tearing down a number of significant buildings, infrastructures, and vegetation areas that were deemed to be non-historic, as it was phrased. The demolition of the 94-meter modernistic viewing tower, the Gettysburg National Tower, in July 2000, initiated the program in grand fashion. A large number of other structures, landmark buildings, but also less significant fences, dirt roads, orchards, have been raised since then. An ambitious tree-felling scheme aimed at removing 576 acres of so-called non-historic trees and vegetation has been underway for several years. And then on the other hand, another 275 acres are being replanted with trees and orchards supposed to represent those that have disappeared since the battle. <coughs> the trees allowed to survive because they can be documented to have been around during the battle, in other words, they are historic, have been poetically dubbed witness trees. This is, I couldn't, uh, this is actually from a Missouri park, so sorry, but we do have witness trees in Gettysburg as well. As Jim Weeks, the historian, has noted, uh, quote, props are being added to the landscape and reminders of intervening decades stripped away for an unmediated face-off with 1863, unquote. It is, of course, hardly unmediated, uh, except perhaps in the minds of its planners, but involves, I would say, a huge amount of editorial decision-making and practical landscaping to instill an idea of non-mediation. So, to come back to the term vicarious, um, we learn from the dictionary uh, that uh, one meaning of it, at least, centered on qualities such as substitution or delegation, or we could say on standing in for something or someone else. Vicarious in this version means, quote, acting or serving in place of someone or something else, substituted or committed or entrusted to another as powers of authority, delegated. Now, if reenactors mostly seek the outright experiential vicarious thrill, the first of, of the four definitions, uh, they also act as stand-ins, or what perhaps uh, Bruno Latour would call placeholders or lieutenants from the French uh, lieutenant, holding the place of for someone else. And they stand in in several senses. In their own view, of course, they stand in for those brave soldiers who went before them, the men better than me that Mark passionately talked about. Uh, or as Torsten, who is a Danish reenactor, explained to me, quote, I feel like we are some sort of link between those who fell back then and then our time, unquote. Torsten went on to talk about how, as a reenactor, he would often feel inspired. Uh, the Danish term is beschel, that is sort of a romanticist uh, inspiration filling him with urges and the spirits of the places, past events and memories that he reenacted. In some cases, of course, reenactors actually stand in for named characters, often famous ones, such as Confederate generals Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or even President Abraham Lincoln. Indeed, there exists a whole association, association of Lincoln uh, presenters. Some of you may know this. But. Oh, yeah, then we have Frederick Douglass, one, one of him. This is, uh, we could say, the simple sense in which reenactors substitute for someone else. In another more critical, perhaps more politically infused sense, we may ask, 
what and, in, and how this way of approaching the civil war, or indeed any past, coexists with, takes the place of, or substitutes for other ways of rendering the past uh, intelligible. As I asked in the beginning, substituted for what, delegated by whom. And there is, of course, a number of scholars who have over the years criticized conventional reenactment and living history as providing shallow, romanticized, whitewashed, or downright false history. In their view, reenacting is often, or according to some, even generically characterized by a hollow and superficial or commercialized or politically orthodox or otherwise dangerously um, relation to real history. I would say that while it's certainly true that in many cases reenactment and reenactors have tended to serve traditional, traditionalist perspectives, not least on the US scene, um, as argued, for instance, by Australian historian Brad West, the question is, does it have to be that way? I would like to suggest that it doesn't, and also that if it is viewed not so much as a quest for complete authenticity, but as a critical corporeal engagement with history and memory. Reenactment may, in fact, provide new experiential opportunities. In some senses, I would argue, reenactment um, arguably digs deeper, if you will, than standard modes of history and heritage representation, exactly because it includes the sensual, the corporeal, and the kinesthetic. So in my view, to put it briefly, the haptic and experiential character of reenactment holds promise and potential for work within the heritage field. This does not mean that I encourage uncritical embracement of any and all attempts at reenactment. I would insist, however, that reenactment does not, as argued by some of these critics, um, of and by itself distort or falsify history or heritage. I will also suggest that an academically reflexive dialogue and critique, and in some cases even co-participation, may in fact be productive in shaping fresh awareness, heightened reflexivity, counter-narratives, and also generate increased access for new audiences. So here's my conclusion then. Um, it's interesting to note that if we look to other disciplines, like film and performance studies, instead of uh, history and archaeology, a significantly more curious, explorative, and perhaps uh, constructive engagement with reenactment reenactment seems to dominate. A number of filmmakers, performers, and other artists have experimented with the use of reenactment, not so much in pursuit of a pure authenticity or of unattainable utopic nostalgia that Mark and, and the others longed for, but as a method that ruptures and disturbs the neat uh, uh, and taken for given conceptions of what temporality might be, causality, or indeed history. And without going into a lengthy discussion of these uh, standard conceptions and ideas, we could perhaps say that they, the standard conceptions of history, revolve around what Scott Lash has called, quote, the rationality of Cartesian space and Newtonian time, unquote. So go back to go back to one of the first informants I quoted today, Jonathan, the American Civil War enthusiast, who claimed it was so amazing to actually walk a mile in their shoes. Such an expression obviously doesn't really make sense if we view it through the lens of a strict rationalism, since the shoes that he talks about are not, rationally speaking, their shoes, but contemporary reproductions of 1860s models. Still, he insists, such insistences, I would argue, can be said to imply a challenge to rational thought and to the black and white common sense distinction between being there and not actually being there. They attempt arguably, to capture the experiential enjoyment derived from occupying what we caught, could call the gray zone, the gray in between now and then. So when I entitled this talk uh, Shades of Gray, this was of course a, a smartish reference to uh, not just that book, but also the colors of the Confederate uniforms uh, that I found myself uh, in and amongst during my American fieldwork. But it is also uh, an attempt to designate a kind of gray zone, much like some of the earlier presenters actually had it, in which these different temporal registers uh, can be allowed to coexist. 
Uh, and I would actually argue, but that is a longer discussion for another day, that reenactment occupies several gray zones we could explore if we had another hour or two. Um, so it lies in between production and consumption, you could say, of history or heritage, in between experts and laymen, in between play and seriousness, in between museum and theater, perhaps. So I'm almost there, and you're not asleep yet. American, uh, so as I said, I found many of the performance and film studies people quite inspirational in their approaches. And one such person is American performance scholar Rebecca Schneider, who has written a brilliant book called Performing Remains, that some of you might know, and that constitutes an important inspiration for my own analysis. She has suggested that reenactment can be set to, quote, contest uh, tightly stitched Enlightenment claims to the forward-driven linearity of temporality, unquote. And in her suggestive phrasing, I quote her again, a reenactment uh, both is and is not the acts of the Civil War. It is not not the Civil War. And perhaps through the cracks in the not-not, something cross-temporal, something effective, and something affirmative circulates. Something is touched. And it is this quality of circulation, if you will, or touch, between different registers of temporality that I'm after. To give one final example of what I think is a powerful use of reenactment, we could look to filmmaker Joshua Oppenheimer's uh, brilliant, I think, actually mind-blowing documentary, The Act of Killing, from 2012, in which former Indonesian gangsters uh, reenact the mass killings, their own killings, of supposed communists in the 1960s. And here, Oppenheimer's idea is not to create a past as it really was. Indeed, the film includes various, very surreal passages. If you haven't seen it, you should. But the idea is instead to forcibly animate, enliven, or perhaps vivify past memories and collective traumas. So to engage with histories, including those of the repressed, through sophisticated, effective engagement and disturbing co-authorships. Professor of Film Studies, Joram Tin Brink, in his discussion of the legacy of the great philosopher of history, uh, R.G. Collingwood, insists that reenactment is, at its core, a process of critical thinking. Tin Brink is also acutely aware, however, that many popular reenactment activities today, such as battle reenactments in particular, tend to, I quote him, perpetuate ideologies rather than question them. Oh, shouldn't see that yet. Um, and echoing this, uh, historian Mark Salber Phillips stated that reenactment, it is true, has often served as a vehicle for the politics of traditionalism, but it is a mistake to assume fixed correlations between form, effect, and ideology. So, on this note, on need for an uprooting of fixed correlations, I would like to end suggesting um, optimistically, uh, perhaps uh, naively, that an explicit interdisciplinary outlook might be worthwhile inviting historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, and others who have traditionally perhaps mostly opposed the reenactment genres to allow, if you will, a certain delegation of their, our expertise, responsibility, and ownership of the past to other professionals, including artists, filmmakers, and performance people. Thank you for your time. <laughs>